Hi, good evening here from Singapore and a good morning and afternoon to our Yakapat colleagues and friends across the world. I'm Dr. Se Hao Ong, um, our organizing chair of the 24th Yakapat World Congress and a psychiatrist from the Institute of Mental Health, Singapore. A warm welcome to everyone and I hope you and your family are well during this coronavirus pandemic. As you may already know, the Yakapat Live Congress has been postponed and converted to a virtual conference to, to take place from the 2nd to the 4th of December 2020. As part of Yakapat's commitment to continue engaging child and adolescent psychiatrists and allied professions worldwide, we have organized this special webinar to bring together everyone today on the 20th of July, which is a first day of the live Congress if it had not been disrupted um, by the COVID-19 situation. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, many countries have mounted an early and effective response to the pandemic in order to bring the virus spread under control. However, we are not in the woods yet as millions of lives are still being impacted, many in a disproportionate way depending on their country of origin, social, economic and physical health status. Healthcare professionals like yourselves have stepped up during this global pandemic and many have been deployed to medical and isolation facilities to support local and national efforts in your fight against COVID-19. We would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your sacrifice and steadfastness. At this juncture, I would like to our delegates to participate in this poll to help us understand the situation uh, of COVID-19 in your country or region better. Here are the post questions. How are your local health services coping with the COVID-19 pandemic? You can select one of the following by clicking the button and we'll get the answers shortly. Okay, here are the, your responses. Um, great, I am glad to see that the majority feeling, are feeling that they are in quite good position uh, in the control of the COVID-19 uh, in your locality uh, with 41%. Uh, this is followed by just about right, 24% and uh, very well or well at 21%. However, there's still um, a certain number of regions or countries uh, not doing so well. And I think this is a fight that we, we have to continue to uh, going, uh, fighting on. Next question, please. In your experience, have there been an, any increase in mental health symptoms among children and adolescents during COVID-19? Please select one of the following, yes or no. Right, uh, a resounding majority uh, have, ob have observed an uh, increase in mental health symptoms among children and adolescents right, uh, in COVID-19 affected regions and countries at 81%, right? So definitely you can see a direct impact or even uh, indirect impact as well on, on mental health conditions um, in children and adolescents. Third question, please. If there were symptoms, 
what do the children and adolescents typically present with? Uh, you can select one or more of the following. One, stress and anxiety. Two, depression including grief. Three, trauma or trauma-related issues. Four, conduct or behavioral issues. And five, conflicts within family. Thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, 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 our colleagues in, uh, in the mental health field have registered a high presentation of stress and anxiety among children and adolescents uh, presenting during COVID-19. And this is followed by conflicts within family and conduct or behavioral issues. Um, uh, this seems to mirror some of the, my own findings in my clinic, uh, but however, it could be very different uh, for other countries or other regions, but definitely, um, you know, you see an increase in, in, in anxiety and behavior issues uh, and frictions in the family. Thank you for your answers. Today's theme for the introductory webinar, COVID-19, child and adolescent mental health care, disruption or evolution, is therefore very appropriate for us as healthcare professionals, especially during these extraordinary times. Through sharing, discussion and learning from one another, we can be better prepared for any future threats and disasters, be they man-made or natural. Again, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar and I hoped to see you at our very first Yakapap virtual conference from the 2nd to 4th of December 2020. Right now, I'd like to hand over to the chair of today's webinar, Dr. Liu Jing, and uh, she, she is from Beijing, China, and uh, she will be chairing the rest of today's session. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this conference. Uh, I'm Jin Liu from Peking University Institute of Mental Health. I'm a chair of medicine psychiatry. It's my good honor to chair the first session of the conference. As we know that 2020 is a very special year. From the beginning of the year, the COVID-19 with high contagious or high mortality has been spread across the world rapidly. The COVID-19 has brought serious damage to the physical health of human beings and also the mental health of women, including the mental health of children and adolescents. Um, from the beginning of the epidemic spread of COVID-19, more and more professionals related to the child and adolescent mental health in different countries have been taken actions to improve the mental health of children and adolescents during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we express our high respect to all professionals working in the field to defeat COVID-19 and protect the physical and mental health of child and adolescents, including all participants of the conference online now. We also invite the three professions from different countries to share their experience. We hope their experience will provide reference to the professionals of other countries and to promote the mental health of children and adolescents all over the world. Okay, now let's welcome the fourth speaker. The first speaker is Professor Kim Boning. Professor Kim Boning is the professor and the director of the Division of the Child and Lancet Psychiatry at the Shaw National University Hospital, South Korea. He is also a professor at the Shaw National University 
colleague of medicine. He is the president elect of Korea Academy of Child Lens and Psychiatry and a vice president of the International Association for Child Lens and Psychiatry. His topic is our efforts to prevention and innovation for the child mental health problems in the time of school closure in Korea. Welcome, Professor Kim. Hello, hello everybody in the world. Uh, I hope you are doing well and your family members doing well in this uh, Corona pandemic uh, uh, disaster uh, the period. I want to talk about today the uh, our efforts of prevention and intervention for the children's mental health problems uh, in the time of COVID-19 epidemic in Korea. I want to talk briefly about the uh, the uh, situation in the world. You know that this slide you are uh, very familiar with the uh, many news newspapers or some um, webinars. So uh, the whole world is covered by uh, uh, coronavirus right now. It's very uh, tragedy, and our Korea is now here. We are also very uh, suffering from the uh, uh, pandemic uh, problems in uh, our countries. Uh, for the, um, the mental health, we are very trying to uh, our uh, Korean Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists. Uh, we are very eager to uh, the, uh, enhance the mental health the, the, of, of the children and adolescents. Also, uh, we performed some uh, early intervention and prevention effort uh, to them. I want to talk briefly about that. Okay. Okay, yeah. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows the uh, very short uh, summary of the, uh, our statistics in the coronavirus right now. Uh, we have a confirmer uh, in July, uh, 13,001, uh, 13,000 person. And then we have uh, 283 deaths toll uh, till now. Uh, you know, the uh, our uh, government and uh, our people are very eager to perform the, uh, uh, the social distancing and any kinds of a hygiene effort. We are now very uh, slowly uh, decreasing tendency in the uh, conformal and also uh, uh, the uh, 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 the uh, self-isolating uh, persons. Uh, you know, the, uh, we have three phases of pandemic. The uh, first one is a preparation phase, and second one is a punctum maximum phase, and then return to normality phase. I think we are now the uh, return to the normality phase. I hope it will uh, go to the uh, totally normalization uh, process. Uh, within each phase, differential side, different psychosocial reaction exists. Uh, if we made some uh, epidemiological measures, it can lead to the flattening, more flattening and uh, more prolongation of curve. So uh, uh, like a, a mask wearing or social distancing, uh, this kind of epidemiological measure is very, very important to reduce the uh, uh, the maximum uh, curve and also to the shorten the uh, uh, the this the elongation of the curve to the normality. I think we are now on the way of this uh, normality phase. I think. When we talk about the uh, coronavirus 19 epidemic and child mental health issues, uh, we can uh, organize our subject of this kind of one slide. Uh, the general children adolescents, and uh, the one part is general children adolescents, and another part is a high risk children and adolescents with some uh, psychiatric problems. Among them, uh, the uh, confirmed infected cases confirmer and then uh, uh, the more self-containers. Uh, we have to care all of these kinds of child and adolescents and their families. 
So uh, I want to talk about briefly about the confirmed cases uh, in our hospital uh, who was who developed uh, very acute psychosis and the, and uh, the management of them very briefly. And this is one case report actually, very interesting case. Uh, who is the 14 years old girl and previously very healthy and uh, uh, she is very active. Uh, girl who participate in the education. However, uh, this year, uh, the March, uh, the person, her, her sister came back uh, to Korea from uh, London, UK. Uh, at the time, the Korean uh, quarantine is not so strict. So uh, she came to direct it to the family and then have a, had a family dinner. Uh, during the family dinner, they have a uh, uh, contact with each other with the uh, uh, parents and uh, my patient. Uh, my patient sister has some kind of symptoms of uh, 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 respiration, so uh, she tested the COVID-19. She performed the COVID-19 positive, so I started receiving hospital care on that day. After the next day, the whole family screening done. During the screening process, my patient confirmed the COVID COVID-19, so admit the same world, uh, same hospital uh, with her sisters. At the time, she had some fevers and cough and sniff and severe substance. During the stay at the hospital, uh, the patient had been very stressful over world environment conditions because the war room is a, uh, has some very uh, emergency uh, room, so uh, uh, they had a portable forced air system to negative pressure to make a negative pressure which caused very non-stop loud noise for 24 hours so very severe due, uh, the, due to the very serious noise the patient had a hard time to sleep at the time uh, she admitted this hospital for two weeks uh, she when by the time the she was discharged she is re recovered in the physical health however she become a little bit unstable become talkative. Uh, uh, originally, she is very uh, cautious and very uh, courteous, uh, the young uh, the adolescents, but she become a little bit elated. So, uh, and also uh, she experienced some kind of a uh, uh, gas voice. So, uh, uh, I want to show the uh, the world, the room at uh, where, where the, uh, the girl is now the, uh, uh, admitted. And this is uh, the portable first air system. It caused a very serious noise uh, for 24 hours at the time uh, during her uh, hospitalization. So uh, she uh, suffered from the sleep deprivation and the serious stress about the uh, noise. The, the noise level is around uh, uh, the, uh, the power drill, something like that. So she became, uh, after the returning to, to, to the home, she was a little bit regressed and anxious. And also she was more talkative and more hyperactive. And a few days later, uh, she, her psychotic symptom had appeared, like a delusional uh, thinkings, delusional religious themes, and auditory hallucination girls' voice, and aggressive uh, behavior toward the uh, their parents and her sisters. So therefore, she visited our hospital ward, the neuropsychiatric outpatient clinic, and she was admitted at that uh, on that day. Uh, during the day of admission, we checked the, uh, her mental health, mental status examination. The mood is elated and irritable, and thought contents co contained the delusional uh, thinking. A delusion of guilt and religion and prosecutory delusion also. And also she has some auditory hallucination, uh, the, the God's voice, uh, the which is the, uh, uh, the the very critical voices and the visual hallucinations also suspected. Uh, so uh, from this kind of a men, a mental health we uh, assume that the bipolar episode of this a manic episode, we managed the uh, the, uh, with the medication and with some stress reduction, supportive psychotherapy with the family education, 
Fortunately, she recovered very well after two weeks treatment with eight current psychotics and mood stabilizing agent. Now she is now uh, you know, almost full recovery and uh, maintains the therapy with the AAP, low dose AAP and supportive PT in the outpatient clinics. So uh, uh, in this case, uh, the very healthy young adolescents have uh, uh, suffered from some serious a psychotic episode after uh, uh, coronavirus infection and uh, uh, two weeks uh, uh, the world admission uh, the world admission environment is very poor and very stressful uh, i can summarize the psychiatric problem in patient with covid virus the causes of psychiatric problems in covid virus positive patient uh, is three uh, causes the first one is the viral infection itself. The viral uh, can invade the brain and uh, change the, uh, the function of a neural network. They can cause some uh, uh, neuroinflammation actually. So uh, that kind of uh, neuroinflammation can cause uh, uh, psychotic and behavioral and emotional symptoms. And second one is antiviral treatment neurotoxic effect. So one is uh, uh, the neuropsychiatric stress by a quarantine. So uh, the three kinds of uh, causes can cause some psychiatric problems. Uh, 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 2014, we have uh, the sub, uh, experienced the MERS infection uh, in South Korea. Uh, from that MERS experience, we have analyzed uh, some data, uh, 24 MERS survivors. Among them, 70% expected psychiatric symptoms and 41% received diagnosis medication. They have support from the auditory hallucination and angry outbursts and some kind of a delirious symptom also. Um, so uh, psychiatric problems in patients with infectious disease like COVID-19, I, I, uh, when I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, the effect of coronavirus itself on brain is one of the key issues to uh, make them uh, the behaviorally and psychologically and emotionally unstable. Uh, the retrospective study from Wuhan in China, they, have, they confirmed some CNS involvement and many reports nowadays from UK or US reported the brain imaging abnormality after coronavirus infection ulcers. And second uh, reason is a neuropsychiatric side effect of medication, like a uh, corticosteroid treatment and also antiviral treatment is uh, the neurotoxic in some cases. This also some makes some uh, the psychiatric problems. And third one is the quarantine issues. The quarantine uh, process is very stressful, and the duration, a longer duration of quarantine is. Uh, make more psychiatric symptoms. So a uh, high prevalence of emotional disturbance during quarantine, like depression and insomnia, and uh, life cycle, the sleep cycle, the disruptions and irritability, and some kind of mania symptoms and post-traumatic stress disorder ulcers. Okay, and second, uh, the type of subject is uh, uh, the high-risk children and adolescents. Uh, I want to talk about briefly. I, will, I uh, perform and I and my colleagues performed the uh, examination of uh, SNU Children Hospital outpatient quick review about the uh, uh, psychiatric symptom change from uh, February to June this year. We evaluate the outpatient, find a change of psychiatric symptoms and function from our ADHD clinic, actually ADHD cohort uh, from our uh, uh, the clinic. Uh, 136 children adolescent outpatient was evaluated. We found that um, significantly worse, even though no change of medication, the, the, the more uh, disruptive and more hyperactive and some uh, depressive and anxious and some kind of stress related uh, somatization symptoms, Almost 65% of my uh, uh, patient had uh, significantly worse uh, during this time. So I checked the, uh, uh, the systematically checked the uh, risk factors, 
and I want to, I can find out the related factors uh, with the aggravation of the symptoms of ADHD in our clinic. I want to organize the five, top five uh, related factors with symptom aggravation. The first one is the economic crisis and patient's job loss, parents' job loss. So kind of poverty is a big issue to aggravate the symptoms. Second one is the treatment and education disruptions due to coronavirus. And third one is uh, uh, the, stress, the parental stress burden increased and children, adolescents stress also increases. The burden of stress is increases. And first one is interestingly related with uh, a previous ACE experience, like uh, uh, abuse and uh, the kind of neglect. And fifth one is uh, the status of refugee or immigrants. It's also vulnerable to the symptom aggravation in this period. This, this is the top five related factor of our patient symptom aggravation, especially ADHD. Uh, the, uh, you know the uh, common fact effect of a coronavirus pandemic on families, uh, homeschooling, the school closer. So big burden to their parents to care the uh, children, adolescents in the home. So uh, some kinds of a child and uh, child abuse and domestic violence also increases, as I mentioned before, and also other researchers uh, reported bef before in the economic crisis seasons. Uh, not only a pandemic, but also economic crisis, family conflict increase and child abuse uh, increases in especially low SS group and externalizing behavior in adolescents is also uh, increases and especially and the, in, uh, the disruption of uh, the special education, especially in IDOASD groups. And third one is the general children and adolescents uh, mental health uh, issues. I want to talk about that. Uh, you know, there are many others also uh, uh, suffer from Corona Blue and the coping uh, guidelines also developed for them. Uh, Especially uh, school closure period, the corona pandemic uh, season, the effect of home confinement on children can cause uh, uh, the low public activities. And when the children are out of school, physically less, less active and longer screen time, like gaming or SNS time, and irregular sleep pattern, a less favorable diet, that they can get some more uh, weight and loss of cardiorespiratory fitness. And uh, regarding mental health, they have some more stressors and uh, the lack of the fear of infection, something like that. So during the time, the COVID-19 can cause school closing and, uh, and uh, rock up. And during the time, we have to make them more healthier to, to by the fear management and uh, malinformation control guiding uh, the right way and the stress and resilience. So the, through the, uh, this kind of effort, we can enhance the post just the growth at the, in the final uh, the, the end. So we are trying to uh, make some guideline in Korean Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry. We have two uh, type of uh, uh, guideline or uh, coping strategy, uh, the small booklet for them. First one is a coping stress uh, tips for family. And second one is tips for uh, adolescent. Uh, tips for family is a um, kind of coping uh, with the stress uh, of COVID epidemic. It's a very interesting uh, short uh, summary of the uh, family member and children can help together. Uh, we organized these this activities uh, in one week. They one, uh, keeping the conversation and coping the start, hygiene care and something like that. And day two is a scheduling, uh, the uh, maintaining the everyday life routine uh, uh, together uh, to, uh, to be, even if there are no school, but um, we have to meal time and regular exercise and some kind of a, a regular uh, the starting time or something like that. So uh, uh, we can organize the, uh, a uh, one day schedule, uh, reorganize actually, one day schedule uh, made to maintain their everyday routine life. And day three is uh, at increasing physical activities plus relaxation technique like uh, 
uh, kind of yoga or some uh, mindfulness exercise or something like that to the uh, calm down our emotional activities. And it, therefore, it play in love. We can make some um, more good nutrients. We can good. Uh, we can get a good nutrients to make our physically healthy to, uh, to enhance the immunities. And therefore, I'm spend, spending time together. Some kind of uh, in, some enjoy some very uh, precious time with the family members, like music, dance, or some other uh, interesting uh, and the play playing the game together. Day six is day for myself. So uh, a relaxing time, uh, thinking uh, myself and my family members and preparing the, the futures uh, after we return to the normal, normal week, normal cycle. And day seven is uh, for your children, uh, things to teach like uh, hygiene care and mask wearing or some the things to do uh, in the, this period. So uh, this kind of oral activities, family tips can protect our mind from COVID-19. This for adolescents is more simple. It's uh, for adolescent uh, coping skill, uh, the teaching book, uh, healthy body and healthy mind, uh, inform the exact uh, the good information about COVID-19. And, and first one is personal hygiene, you know, washing hands and wearing the mask is very emphasized. And then no more fake news. Uh, the uh, truthfulness, truthful, uh, truthful news is very emphasized. It's the uh, critical point of view uh, to the, uh, the fake news is very increased in this uh, booklet. And the other one is uh, the sleep wake cycle maintenance. Uh, uh, the stay healthy, uh, the process. And the first one is to stay together, stay connected via SNS and some kind of uh, uh, interaction with uh, uh, important persons like friends and families and relatives. That's very important. And overcoming the uh, hate and fear is uh, uh, very important to help each other. Uh, it's very important to come out of this uh, also final version. And for the more younger children, we have uh, translated a fairy tale from uh, Spain. The Anna Gomez is a very uh, good writer, I think. The uh, uh, very nice and beautiful story about oyster and the butterfly. Uh, it's a very uh, nice uh, fairy tale. I want everyone to read this uh, fairy tale for your children, especially younger children. The beautiful story to symbolize the uh, power uh, that we can uh, we can our overcome this disaster and uh, to uh, to strengthen our mind to make uh, like uh, making a pearl uh, the, in the oyster. So uh, it is very beautiful story. I want to recommend it to you. And the final one uh, we are. Uh, the mental health uh, enhancement tool, unpacked mental health enhancement tool is an online stress management program for children. Uh, this is a website address. Originally, this uh, the program was developed in 2015. So we have uh, uh, the, the spread this program to the public mental health centers in our country. Uh, however, in this period, COVID period, we can this kind of uh, online stress management program for the uh, school children right now. So uh, this is the uh, the first pages of uh, the homepage. And uh, we uh, th this online stress program have three components. The first one is cognitive behavior approach to reduce the uh, negative cognition to the coronavirus and our, our, our environment input. And second one is a positive psychology to enhance our own resilience. See, this is very a uh, good uh, approach to the uh, uh, overcome this uh, disastrous situation. And so on is mindfulness and relaxation technique. So a three component of online stress program is now available in this uh, program. Uh, in this COVID period, uh, the Seoul Education Department accept this uh, program to be uh, uh, integrate the education program for 
our uh, school age children and adolescents right now. Okay, and since early June, now we opened the school again, uh, partially, but so uh, we are now preparing crisis intervention operation for school uh, after reopen. We are now organizing supporting system to provide medical and psychological support service in the event of COVID-19 uh, uh, related with uh, self-isolation and confirmed cases after attending schools. So we provide a face-to-face -face support at school and non-face-to-face -face support using uh, telephone or uh, the online uh, emails, something like that. The uh, organization of this kind of support is uh, three uh, three parties of, uh, involved. First one is KCAR, the so, uh, Korean Academy of Child Adults and Psychiatrists, medical specialist. And second one is uh, uh, the uh, organizing uh, the center, mental health support center uh, for students. This center is uh, uh, located in Department of uh, uh, education in Korea. They organized uh, all the uh, money and uh, connection system with the uh, uh, school and the KCA members and psychologists. Psychologist uh, is a uh, it's very important part of a real psychological uh, counseling for the uh, low grade uh, psychiatric or psychological. Uh, problem. So uh, it's very important, uh, our partner. So uh, we have made uh, already made a hand line to confirm to provide service to confirm the patient and also uh, provide service to the sufficient, suspicious and quarantined patient right now. So uh, the, the role of the uh, school mental health support center is very important. They are now main organized for school-oriented uh, psychological support system. Uh, KCAP and psychologists can come together uh, with the school mental health support center to organize crisis intervention committee. And also we send the neuropsychiatrist to the school in crisis uh, for teachers and uh, uh, the school students and provide professional information and uh, psychological management for the high-risk cases in school also. So uh, finally, this is uh, almost the final slide. Uh, during the COVID-19 disaster, uh, school closing and restart, and re reclosing is also possible, I think. Uh, during the, this disaster time, we have to make a, a more enhancement uh, uh, of the post digest growth, uh, we have to work uh, together to the all the uh, general child adolescents and high risk groups and confirmed case and self contain also. So it is very huge work, I think. So uh, to to do the huge work, uh, our uh, members in KCAP and school support center and we sent the psychologist groups and the public mental center. Uh, came together and make some uh, group and support system for the school children and adolescents right now in Korea. Okay, this is the final slide. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. This is the reference of preparing this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank Professor Kim's excellent presentation. From his presentation, we know that the simple term and the management of psychiatric problems in patients with COVID-19 COVID infection and the situation of child and lesson in Korea and their innovation for family and child and lesson, their experience will be helpful to the professionals of other countries, to the future work related to the COVID-19. Thank you very much. As the time is limited, so the question and answer is arranged after the presentation of three speakers. Now let's welcome the second speaker. The second speaker is Dr. Susan Soon. Sun Sun is a co-founder of the Physician Support Line of George Washington University Medical Center. 
United States of America. She is a humanitarian child and adult psychiatrist and a leading advocate for the most vulnerable population of the world. She is the director of the Division of the Child, Adolescent, and Family Psychiatry at George Washington University, advisor to the United States Department on Human Trafficking and Human Tail Protection Consultant. Her topic is impact of COVID-19 on refugees refugee and micro-children. Welcome, Professor Soon. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here. Um, and I really look forward to hearing from you. It's such an amazing opportunity to hear from so many people around the world. Um, so I will be talking about refugee mental health. Um, this is from part of my work as a humanitarian protection advisor for children around the world, forcibly displaced kids. So if we could just go to the i cannot advance my okay sorry so here has anybody is there anyone currently or have you ever worked with child or adult refugees forcibly displaced people asylum seekers refugees internally displaced people we'll just take a few seconds Okay, I'm not, great. So, okay, the majority, no. But for many of you, um, you have, so that's wonderful. And um, I asked this question because, sorry, I can't quite advance to my next slide. Um, the numbers of forcibly, forcibly displaced people around the world is very high. One in every 113 people on this planet is forcibly displaced. So um, there are about 29, 25.9 million refugees around the world. This is the highest level ever recorded. And it's important because half of the world's refugees are children. One third of the refugees um, are hosted by the world's poorest countries. So just to go through a few definitions um, of refugee, refugees and asylum seekers. So all have experienced social, religious, cultural, political persecution or war. They're seeking safety. Refugees have already been deemed to have a right to an international protection, whereas asylum seekers have to come to the host country and ask for international protection. Unaccompanied separated minors are those kids who are under 18 who travel alone without a parent or guardian. And then internally displaced people, which I'll focus a little bit on because most don't know as much about internally displaced. Um, they're experiencing political unrest, gang violence, natural disasters, or a serious circumstance that forces them out of their house. But they have found relative safely, safety within their country. So they're essentially on the run at home. Often the government is the one that forcibly displaces them. So they're still under the rule of the government. Now the number of IDPs, internally displaced people, they have soared by 25% over the past year. And there are now 50 million people about that are fleeing conflict, mostly from Syria, Colombia, the DRC, uh, Yemen, and Afghanistan. Uh, of these 50 million IDPs, more than half of them were displaced only in the past year. So when we think about children who are forcibly displaced, the refugees, asylum seekers, IDPs, 
And what was their life like before the pandemic? Well, they were on the move. They were in migration, fleeing their homes from safety, from armed conflict, uh, war, violence. They're often moving to multiple countries and camps before being resettled, if they ever are. So there's a large diversity in experiences. Let's say refugees, for example. Um, some have transit experiences without trauma. They can arrive to a host country by plane, with family, relatively safe. Where others, like unaccompanied minors, um, they might be at high risk of trafficking, exploitation, and abuse while they're in migration. So we tend to think of a refugee camp as transitory. If you just ask yourself, I'll ask you this question, um, how long, what do you think is the average length of stay of a person in a refugee camp? Right. So this picture here is, I worked um, with UNICEF in the Syrian refugee camp of Zatari in Jordan in 2013 and 2015. So here many would come in to the refugee camp and most everybody said they believed they would only stay for six months to one year in this camp. And so it's not very important if your children are going to school because they think, oh, it's just six months or so that we'll be in this transitory state. The average length of stay in a refugee camp is 17 years. That's an entire childhood. So we really need to shift expectations um, to allowing and helping people believe and think that their current life circumstance might be how it is for a while, decades plus. Now with the pandemic, um, it's a very important, I think, to think about the government response around the world. So 91% of the global population is currently living in a place where restrictions have been imposed on who can enter the country. 39% live in countries where the borders are completely closed to foreigners. That means that there's limited access for those fleeing from conflict or disaster. On average, there are 37,000 people that are forced to flee every single day. Now, there are some countries that are offering increased rights to migrants and refugees who have already arrived. Portugal, for example, granted migrants temporary citizenship so they have access to healthcare, but others Many European governments and the United States are turning people away, um, using the pandemic as an opportunity to repackage their migration control policies, closing their borders, citing public health measures to minimize the spread of COVID. The US has already thrown out decades of law and practice for the treatment of migrants at the border. Governments have also reduced NGO search and rescue capacity, meaning many people in transit face more dangerous journeys. They're forced to endure endless hours at sea, waiting days at crossings without adequate food, water, or deportation back to their homes where it's unsafe. With resettlement, uh, relocation, and repatriation mechanisms suspended, there's also no alternatives for refugees and migrants trying to escape. So this is a picture of um, Malaysia recently turned away a boat of Rohingya refugees, stating the, the entry would hinder the country's fight against COVID. They were left at sea for about a month or so. So with these closed borders, people cannot flee violence, but they still need to find safety, so they become internally displaced. So what happens after the migration and they're coming to this, quote, transitory state, this transition state of a camp or a settlement or a detention center? Well, the humanitarian sector has minimum standards, let's say for a refugee camp, um, maximum of 120 people per one water tap or 3.5 square meters of living space per person. Most camps are operating beyond this capacity, making simple protective measures like hand washing or distancing next to impossible. Refugees are already vulnerable. They don't have land for cultivation. They're financially incapacitated. They cannot travel up to the food distribution center to get food relief supplied by the World Food Program because they're very far. And so the elderly and pregnant women are majorly affected. We know kids are the ones who typically go out to fetch water and young boys go to distribution sites um, for food. The UN's uh, World Food Program has a $137 million deficit. And in April, they 
cut their food rations to camps in Uganda by 30%. This is a picture of a refugee camp in Kenya, Kakuma camp in Kenya, um, with South Sudanese refugees practicing social distancing as they are waiting um, for at the food distribution sites. So we know that around the world there are vulnerable children with COVID, and we know that that's true within the refugee and forcibly displaced population as well. So there have been increase, increases in child abuse, early pregnancies, and early marriage. There's little to no access to health care, um, and so COVID is further compromising their access to essential services and humanitarian aid. Refugee communities still lack the basics in the fight against COVID, especially with information. So with limited access to radio, um, television, newspapers, internet, maybe a language barrier, it's hard to share information. Also, there's distrust, right? Many people fled their countries without functioning governments. So it's understandable there's a distrust of the government and people are reluctant to obey, obey directives. Right? The, the distrust of the government is justified. In the US, for example, there was recently a federal ruling that found unsanitary and inhumane detention conditions with overcrowding, no access to water, soap, or hygiene. There are reports of spraying chemicals that cause skin burns and eye damage when inhaled. They were spraying them every 15 minutes inside the detention settings with no ventilation and detainees were reporting burning, fainting, and bleeding. So if we move to, let's say, those children who are um, now resettled in the host country, which is probably where you will be seeing kids who are displaced, um, there are 91% of children around the world attend primary school. What percentage of refugee children do you think attend primary school? Okay, so most believe that 25%. Okay, the answer is actually 50%. So 50% of refugee children around the world attend primary school. Um, refugee, so remote learning is not working for refugee children. English as a second language programs are losing children. Uh, for example, in America, we already have one in seven low-income teens who does not have access reliably to the internet. This whole school closing and social, uh, the um, remote learning has just furthered the social economic divide. Domestic violence is soaring amongst families. Child abuse has risen since schools have closed. Kids are relying on schools for food, for shelter. But on top of this in America, we see the cultural and the political aspects at play. We have a president in America um, who does not believe in our science and our public health recommendations. So he's promoting risky behavior against public health and scientific advice. So there's more social unrest between those who believe in wearing masks and social distancing, and those growing movement who believes that this is all a hoax and there's an anti-mask movement. Right? People are beyond frustrated with the political um, environment in the United States. And then with the management of the pandemic, and now we have as well this social uprising where people are no longer tolerating things like police brutality and the systemic racism that is inherent in many of our social systems. Children are witnessing all of this on social media, on TV, through hearing their parents talk. 
Um, it's a lot to take in for a child at this time. Many of our, our refugee children, our children of color, are experiencing discrimination, xenophobia, feeling like they have really nowhere to belong. So how can we help refugee and displaced kids? Well, we can validate their emotions. We validate it's normal to feel a wide range of emotions, sad, stressed, confused, scared, angry during this time. We can help to proactively identify coping strategies, right? People are resilient and many former refugees have skills that have allowed them to survive through very hard situations in the past. So we can ask, what are things that you've done in the past that have helped you cope or feel safe? Who can you talk to? Um, who can you trust to help? And what are some things that you can do to help you distract even for a little bit? We can encourage kids to stay in very close contact with people who are important to them. Um, we avoid social isolation because distancing, physical distancing does not mean social isolation. We can promote daily routines in our life. I love that handout that Dr. Kim shared. Um, I think that's fantastic to share, spread widely. We remind kids that limiting social media exposure can reduce worry and agitation. And we should discourage unhealthy behavior like smoking, alcohol, substance abuse, but also just sleeping all day long. But those are at the individual level and we need to do things systematically. So at the government side, we need to really recalibrate our measures and consider quarantining refugees and migrants on arrival rather than denying them entry. We can quarantine for, with facilities for 14 days. We can allow testing for COVID symptoms or allow self-isolation. We can protect host communities from getting COVID while not sending people back to places where their lives are being threatened. We need to stop the use of immigration detention. We can scale up and implement non-custodial community-based alternatives. We should release all migrants, migrants in detention into alternatives by prioritizing children, families, and others who are vulnerable. And we urgently, while we're doing all of this, we should urgently improve the conditions of immigration detention. So in the US, again, the federal court cited um, our presidential administration for failing to meet the minimum safety standards in detention. They ordered the removal of all children from immigration detention by last Friday. We'll see if this actually happens. But this was after Trump's lawyers disputed whether migrant children are entitled to soap and a toothbrush. Okay. So finance and political commitment are crucial. And they're critical. Leadership and resources will determine how successful a country is in managing a pandemic. And so I will leave you with this chart. These are the daily confirmed cases of COVID. And this chart is of two weeks ago. And this shows that it highlights that a country status and the wealth of a country do not equate to the well being of its people. We really need effective leadership and government level or systems level um, change to really implement the care and well being for all of our people, including those most vulnerable. Thank you. Um, I will leave you also with feel free to, to reach out at any point with questions or thoughts. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. Full disclosure, I don't really know how to use those. But if you, I think if you message me, I think I'll be able to figure it out. Um, and if anyone is interested in learning more about how to work with refugees, children, adolescents, or families, my book was just published about uh, last month. Um, and it's co-edited by, co-edited with Peter Ventvogel, who is the senior mental health advisor to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. We're very excited because the book, um, our authors are amazing from various sectors, the humanitarian world, um, the clinical world, and academics. So I thank you, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Professor Song's excellent presentation. From her presentation, we know the poor situation of refugee and migrant children. 
So we should pay more attention to the need of this very special population. Thank Professor Sun very much. Now let's welcome the third speaker. The third speaker is Dr. Eddie Amy Polenci. Eddie Amy Polenci is an associate professor of child and lesson psychiatry at the University of Sao Paulo Medical School, Brazil, leading various programs and researches. He is currently involved in international and national studies investigating the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on childhood mental health. His work has been funded by various organizations and recognized by multiple awards. His topic is child and adolescent mental health care in pandemic, the Brasilia experience. Welcome, Professor Polenchev. Good morning. Good morning from from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm sorry we are not meeting in person in Singapore. Uh, I'm sure it would be a fantastic meeting that Daniel and Sohon uh, and their team would organize. But on the other hand, I'm very happy to be here and uh, have the opportunity to talk to all of you virtually from uh, Sao Paulo and you across the globe. My task here is uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, how the pandemic has been affected Brazil. Brazil is a continental uh, country and also a fascinating one. We have uh, cities uh, like Rio de Janeiro, which is a beautiful city in the southeast of uh, the country, the richest part of the country. We have also cities like Sao Paulo. This is uh, an image of our hosp uh, university hospital, the largest health complex in Latin America. Uh, in Sao Paulo, we have 23% of the population, of the Brazilian population, located in the great, great Sao Paulo, and uh, around 30% of the GDP uh, uh, the Brazilian GDP in Sao Paulo. Uh, but Brazil is also the country of inequalities, economic and social inequalities, as this picture depicts, is, uh, are very, very common across the country. Uh, we have wonderful natural resources. This is the Amazonas River. We have also the Pantanal. This uh, here is the th south of Brazil, where I come from, where there are there is uh, a strong agriculture, but we also have uh, lands like this one in the northeast, uh, when uh, very very uh, scarce resources. Brazil in numbers, so we have a population of uh, about. 200 million people, 33% of them are age zero to uh, 19. 25% of the population live in poverty and 42% uh, of children zero to 14 years old live in poverty. 13 million of people in our country live in slums. Here you can see how the pandemic is affecting our country. We unfortunately uh, we are we are the I'm sorry I'm receiving I'm, re I'm receiving uh, a message that you cannot, oh, now, now you can see my slides. I'm sorry about that. 
So this is how uh, the pandemic is affecting our country. Okay. Unfortunately, we, we are the second country uh, in the world in the number of cases. We, last night we were, there were 2 million uh, COVID-19 cases in our country and also the second in number of deaths, uh, almost 80,000 deaths in our, in our country. Uh, how the pandemic is affecting our children. All state schools in the country have been closed uh, for now three to four months. Internet is available in 70% of houses in urban areas, but in, in, hero, in rural areas, only about 40% of houses uh, have access to internet. And usually internet is accessible only by phone. Uh, in Sao Paulo, we have 3.7 million students and only 1.5 are accessing online classes or sometimes classes are being offered by TV, open TV, uh, but only 1.5 uh, uh, less than the half of students are following classes at the moment. Uh, in across the country, about 40% 40 fam 40 of families receive financial support from government and unemployment rate nowadays is about 30%. But specialists believe that this rate actually is much higher because people is not looking for uh, jobs and they uh, suspect that rates uh, soon will be around 20-25%. How about the mental health system in Brazil for children? So uh, telehealth and electronic prescription have been recently approved in our country. Uh, at our university hospital, Hospital das Clínicas at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, the whole complex opened 700 beds to COVID patients and 300 uh, intensive care unit beds for those patients. So residents and staff members from all clinics, including child and adolescent psychiatry, have been directed to uh, care to to these uh, uh, to these beds and to these units to take care of uh, patients with COVID. So our division actually in April and May uh, we saw about 15 per, 50 per, 15 percent of cases we usually see severe cases. Those who are inpatient cases actually uh, are uh, are uh, are still being seen and our occupancy rate at the inpatient unit is about 100%. Table outpatient, outpatient patients have been rescheduled with prescriptions and telepsychiatry has been uh, offered, but uh, in a very amateur way because it has been recently approved in our country. So we don't have actually a system, not even a guideline to, uh, to offer and the take-up rate from families about 20 to 30 percent. Uh, in outpatient clinics across the country, uh, they, are, they are called CAPC, uh, telehealth and in-person services are still offered, but take-up rate is about 50 percent. So uh, considering that we have a, a large number of children they are not, seen, not, are not being seen by the services, uh, we, uh, we, we asked what are the routines and habits during this period of social isolation? What are the rates of emotional and behavioral symptoms children are facing? And what are the predictors of children's symptoms? We have uh, been working a lot during this uh, time. We have several initiatives in terms of following uh, children who have been infected by COVID and asking whether they develop neuropsychiatric symptoms. We have uh, interventions uh, that have that are being developed and will be offered via uh, randomized controlled trials. But I'll be showing you one initiative, uh, a national online survey we have been conducting uh, now for 45 days. Uh, families are invited by Facebook, Instagram, or other WhatsApp groups, and they fulfill the questionnaire online and every 30 days they receive uh, another uh, request to fulfill uh, a follow-up questionnaire. Our sample nowadays is about 4,000 
children. Uh, the stu study is ongoing. And after data cleaning, I'll be showing results that are related to about 2,924 uh, 2, uh, children and adolescents. 51% of them are male, mean age is about 10 years, age range is 5 to 17. 68% of them are white, and here we can see that our sample is biased. So 68% of them are white, while in the population uh, you can see in red, 48% of the population is white. Uh, Brazilian population, uh, black, mixed, we can see that there are there is a uh, 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 a small number of mixed uh, uh, children in our sample compared to the population. 70% of them have a chronic disorder, 40% a mental disorder, 55% of, the, of their parents have a university degree versus 8% in the population. So here it is an important data that shows that our sample is biased toward more, uh, more uh, educated people. 58% uh, of them have private health insurance, and most of them come from the southeast of the country, 61% of them. We have people from north, northeast, but, uh, 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 but most of them come from the southeast of the country. Let me show you results about the routine. About 70% of the participants show that uh, uh, tell that they are having good or very good quality of time with their children. 80% show that uh, uh, said that this uh, quality of time have improved during pandemic, and about 30% show that there were positive changes during pandemic. Most of them talk to their friends, most of them don't exercise, 50% are not studying, uh, about 80% of them are online, uh, uh, are more time on internet at this period than previous, 30% feel lonely, 20% are sleeping uh, after 1 a.m. most of the days. In terms of adverse experiences, 22% uh, of parents uh, had uh, symptoms or COVID diagnosis, and 77% of children had symptoms of uh, a clinic or laboratory diagnosis of COVID. Uh, financial problems are very, very common. 80% of the sample have uh, showed uh, financial problems. Uh, family income have reduced, have been affected about 60%. Uh, these are important data. 53% have uh, presented housing insecurity, 38 food insecurity, and about 20% of parents lost their job during this period. Uh, here we have uh, four individuals who had a family member living in the same house who died, 0.1% of the sample. 4.5% of the sample had a family member not living in the same house who died, 10% uh, a family friend who died, and 30% uh, a parent's friend who died. These are the rates of children emotional symptoms according to revised children anxiety and depression, 25 items are CADS. So, in red, you can see the clinical level here uh, for anxiety, here for depression, and on your left side, on your right side for total symptoms. So 13% of the sample presented clinical anxiety levels, 16% uh, of the sample presented depression, uh, clinical depression levels, and uh, total symptoms, which are based on depressive and anxiety symptoms, 17% of the sample. This is the results of the SDQ, Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. Uh, in red, you can see uh, the very high uh, level of symptoms. Uh, in yellow, the high level of symptoms. Blue and uh, green, close to average and slightly raised. So if we take just the very high 
rates of symptoms uh, according to SDQ. We have similar results uh, from the R cards. So 15%, 16% of the sample with emotional symptoms, 6% with conduct symptoms, 10% with hyperactivity, 13% with uh, peer problems, and 15% of the sample according to total score with a very high clinical level. What about the timing of emotional and behavioral problems? So for those who had problems, uh, we asked the question, problems existed before the pandemic? And about 90% of them answered yes. We asked the question, difficulties worsen with the pandemic? And about 56% of them said yes. So most of the problems were already there and most of the problems uh, uh, worsened during this period. This is parent emotion symptoms, uh, the DAS 21, and here we can see depression in the middle, anxiety, and on the right side, stress. About 40% of parents have severe or extremely severe levels of depression, 19% of anxiety, and 15% of stress. And now here we see the rates of parents with severe or extremely severe symptoms of depression on the left, anxiety on the middle, and depression on the right by levels of children's total symptoms. So in green, we see that among children with normal emotional symptoms, levels of parents with severe or extremely severe are low, 9%, for those children with uh, norm or normal score on depression, normal score on, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so for those children with a normal total score, uh, levels of parent depression uh, uh, is nine, 13 uh, and 10%. Uh, for those uh, children with, uh, with a clinical score on RCADS, here represented in red, rates of parents with severe or extremely severe symptoms uh, of depression is 30%, of anxiety, 34%, and of stress, 28%. And here we, he we see a very important Light. This is the rates of children's clinical depression in uh, red, anxiety in blue, and total symptoms in black by family income. As you can see on your left side, we have families with less than 500 reais. This is about $100 per month. And on your right side, more than 20,000 uh, reais. And as you can see, as the income increases, the level of symptoms decreases. This is also true when you use the SDQ for the emotional in red symptoms, uh, conduct symptoms also increase as the income uh, 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 symptoms decrease as income increases, but we don't see this, uh, this trend for hyperactivity. And now rates of children's clinical depression, anxiety, and total symptoms by COVID-19 infection status. So here we have rates uh, uh, of participants with, uh, this is rates of, uh, depression in red, anxiety in blue, and total symptoms uh, for those who never uh, were infected or had symptoms, those who only had symptoms, and those who were infected. And uh, here we see the same slide, but using the SDQ and not the R cards. What we can see is that emotional symptoms increase uh, for those who had the diagnosis, but symptoms of conduct and uh, hyperactivity and peer problems uh, does not increase by in COVID infection status. 
So in a multivariate regression, we ask the question, what are the predictors? Or what are the factors associated with uh, children's emotional and behavioral problems? And here we can see clinical uh, children's depression according to our cards. So uh, uh, the, is the outcome. And we can see that uh, child infection and parent infection are not, pre uh, are not associated, neither uh, SES, but housing insecurity, food insecurity are associated. Parent depression and parent stress are strong predictors of uh, clinical depression. When uh, the outcome is uh, children's clinical anxiety, we see that, that SES is a predictor, as well as parent anxiety and parenting, parent stress. When Clinical depression and anxiety uh, are the predictors. SES, parent depression, uh, I'm sorry, when clinical depression and anxiety is the outcome, uh, we have SES, uh, socioeconomic status, parent depression, parent anxiety, and parent stress as associated with uh, children's clinical depression and anxiety. And when we take SDQ, total score, uh, the clinical score, including emotional and also externalizing symptoms, as SES is also a strong predictor. Food insecurity here is uh, associated, as well as parent depression, parent anxiety, and uh, parent uh, stress. I uh, would like to thank you for your attention, and also I'd like to Thank you, my great team who stopped all they are doing, all their projects, PhD, postdoc projects, and we redirected our efforts to this project and all other projects involving uh, COVID-19 and uh, childhood mental health in uh, our country. Thank you. Thank you, Gulai. I'm waiting for Liu Ching to come back. <laughs> there she is. Okay. Ching, it's all yours. Yeah. Well. Okay. Thank you, Professor Palenci's excellent presentation. From his presentation, we learn the kind of situation of mental health of child adolescent in Brazil and the mental health system in Brazil for child adolescent. Their work and experience will be helpful to the other countries' future work related with. COVID-19. Thanks, Professor Polenci again. Now, let's move to the time of question and answer. This part will be chaired by Professor Daniel Fong. Professor Daniel Fong uh, is the pre uh, president of Yakapak. Welcome, Professor Daniel Fong. Thanks, uh, uh, Ting. Um, I am um, very happy to see all of you. Some of you are asking me, sending me messages. <laughs> Where are you, Daniel? And so I have actually been in the background, and I know that in, in different parts of the world, it's very late or it's very early. Uh, I really uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I'm quite excited to see such a, a wide uh, a group of people. Uh, before we, we get the panelists in, I thought that it would be important if we could ask some of the questions that was on the um, Q&A section. We had about 23 questions, um, but, um, well, we could start with uh, uh, Professor Kim uh, Bung Yun. Hun Yun, would yep. you like to talk a little bit? Um, give us more of your pearls of wisdom, you know, the, the story of the pearls. Uh, there, there, was, okay. there were a number of questions that was asked uh, of you. Really? Like, okay. Uh, um, yes. Like in the you, case study that you, yeah. Mm, this story is uh, actually pearls and uh, pearl oyster and the butterfly, actually. The yeah, two characters that uh, uh, they, uh, she, uh, Amanda Gomez, maybe her name of the writer of this fairy tale from Spain, uh, she uh, symbolized the uh, uh, children's uh, the, uh, uh, the travel uh, into uh, uh, more valuable things like a pearl in the oyster, because uh, oyster can suffer from many kinds of uh, uh, the suffering, like uh, uh, the scars of a uh, knife or something, the, the tremendous uh, waves of something like that, such a uh, the, the, the 
big disasters or small stress or something like that can make uh, uh, the scars on the, uh, uh, the oyster's uh, body, they can become the, uh, the pearls, you know, yeah. And butterfly also during the cap uh, caterpillar period, they came uh, come through the uh, many the uh, the stress, but afterwards they come be they become the uh, butterfly with the wings and beautiful wings, you know. Yeah. So during the uh, symbolization process, many people, many children in the world can suffer from uh, such a the, the small or big stress or trauma or something like that. They become more valuable uh, figure in the future. During the fairy tale, they, Gomez described the uh, power uh, they can have afterwards the, the, when overcome the uh, disaster. There are very many kinds of uh, powers. So you can read, I can send my uh, fairy tale because she uh, released the uh, old, old uh, the, 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 the release the, uh, the publication to the older people in the world so I can send you. So we can share it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's very good. We will share it on our website. Uh, all yeah. of today's um, recordings will be shared on the ACAPAP uh, 2020 website. So uh, yes. uh, do not worry if you miss parts of it. Um, yes. There is a question about your case studies, right? The case study that you gave, do you remember the case study? Um, yeah. Did the girl's symptoms improve and was she discharged COVID free or was she still having, uh, was she still oh. COVID positive when she developed COVID her psychiatric free. symptoms? Yeah, yeah. After discharge from the uh, original uh, the, uh, COVID treatment ward, uh, at that time, the discharging, she uh, is a COVID-free status. Yeah. Okay. And were there any signs of neuroinflammation in uh, the imaging studies um, that were done on... Yeah, we conducted some kind of MRI, MRA, or so some autoimmune markers or some CRP markers or something like that. But we don't have any kinds of clues in the infection. But um, we okay. did not have a, I think we don't have a, uh, such a uh, mm, tested uh, CD4 or CD8 uh, lymphocyte marker. So uh, we, with such a uh, very uh, expensive marker cannot be done uh, to her. So uh, uh, if the uh, we the perform the more uh, thorough uh, biological marker for them for for her, we can find something more. Uh, during routine marker uh, check, we don't have any uh, inflammation biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have a and the online stress program that you described? Is it available yep. in English? Is it available in I'm English? I'm sorry, now it's a Korean only, but um, we can update the English version, but um, uh, you, can, you can make that, I think. <laughs> in okay, okay. We, work, we work with you on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, Suzanne, you, you know, um, I, was, I was making a comment just now that for Suzanne's talk, it should have been called disruption, evolution, or revolution, right? <laughs> <laughs> revolution, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you, you know, you, you shared uh, quite a bit about the refugees and all that, but um, one of the questions was about how mental health professionals should influence governments. Uh, after all, um, you know, some governments may do things that are quite against public um, uh, principles. Any comments on that? Yeah, so this is a very difficult question. It's a, it's a very relevant and um, it's a fantastic question. I think it starts with education. So the first is that now is the time for all physicians, child psychiatrists especially, but all physicians to really use your voice to advocate because now is a time, especially with COVID, that people are listening to doctors, right, to healthcare workers. And so whatever you're seeing, whatever you're experiencing, now is a time to really engage with the community to start building advocacy networks and supports. Um, no, I, so I'm an advisor to our U.S. State Department and to our Office of Refugee Resettlement, right? So that is the actual agency that is managing the crisis at the border. Clearly, my opinions um, and my experiences are, and my recommendations are very much counter to what the government is implementing right now. And yet, I'm still working with them. 
And that was a deliberate choice because, um, you know, while we can be very careful and we're, we don't want to ostracize um, the people who are making these uh, decisions, we still need to influence. And we really do that by collectively kind of talking about our experiences and what you're seeing in real life, because that's what you know, policymakers, they don't have experience, but you all do. And uh, one more question is about the role of schools, particularly in these, um, well, you said 50% of them go to primary school, right? So uh, mm -hmm. I suppose you could reach out to 50%. Yeah, I know yeah, the point that you would. <laughs> the schools have a very, clearly a very important role. Um, in the refugee camp settings, you know, many kids, we, schools, so UNICEF does build schools in most all refugee camps. Whether or not the children choose to go to school is another issue. And, but I think more people, because internet's not widely available, more people are trying to educate on by radio or by phone, other mo modalities of teaching. For those who are in, um, in kind of higher income, middle income countries with a, who are doing remote learning, especially like, let's use America as an example, I'm concerned about schools because we are burdening schools so much, right? right? In America, at least, schools are tasked with its responsibility to end homelessness, to solve poverty, to manage child abuse, to manage, you know, right now there's a huge debate about whether schools should reopen in America or not. So right now, America has 50, 50, 50 times the number of newly confirmed cases per day compared to our peer countries, right? And there is no leadership or guidance about schools reopening or closing. So it's determined per state. So one state, let's say California can say, or you know, one even, um, small part of California can say, we're going to open schools fully, no precautions, no masks, no distancing, nothing. Whereas um, where I am in Maryland or close by in Virginia, DC, some people are saying, okay, we're starting the school year all remote, right? So we're closing school. So there's huge disparities of different opinions. And Teachers are not given the options. Like no one's really discussing with teachers what they feel comfortable doing, if they will have protective gear or not. Um, mm -hmm. So when kids do go back to school, we have to focus on social emotional care, right? Yes. So trauma informed care for those kids. We should imagine that kids have gone through a lot during these recent four or five months. And when they're coming back to school, especially how they're coming back, if they're coming back in mass and, you know, in some sort of a physical barrier, it's a very different environment experience than what they might be thinking of. Um, and we have to teach kids, I think, about how to be a moral witness, which is when, when they're witnessing bullying or their racism or any of the, you know, these are your children, any of the normal social hardships and acting out, those will just be amplified, right? When they're back in school, they're not going to go back to school and be these pleasant, well-behaved children. So we have to teach kids how to build the empathy and how to really be a moral witness to each other. And yeah, schools are very, I have a, a lot of respect for our educators. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose uh, that's linked to to, to a couple of questions, I think it's is uh, uh, leveled at uh, Gulaim. Uh, perhaps you can talk a little bit about some of that exposure to violence. Um, I think it was a question directed to you specifically uh, because of what you were describing. How do you think the children are reacting to that? And uh, also uh, whether mental health screening would be suitable in schools, kind of linked to Suzanne's answer, but, but in the broader sense, perhaps Gulaim could Make some comments on those questions. Um, uh, can, Daniel, I'm sorry, I had a delay. Can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, one question was about exposure to violence. Um, how does that? Uh, how do you think um, uh, this is different um, during the uh, this different forms of violence? How would you measure them during COVID-19? I think this is in direct relation to your presentation. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So family violence, I think. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Who was that question directed towards? Well, it seemed to be directed to Gulen, but Suzanne wants to answer it. <laughs> oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'll just, maybe we can both answer it. Um, so just the comment about how can children manage the exposure to violence? Um, I would say, and I think the question was around a comparison with war, when kids are exposed to war. Um, and community-based violence. Um, we know it's very clear that the majority of children of war, war-affected children, will actually fare just fine, right? There is a small subset that will have a really difficult time, but the majority will be okay. And a large predictor of whether or not, of that outcome, is whether or not the child has an attachment figure that can help them modulate their emotional experiences and response. So we really need to make sure that, I think one of the hardest problems right now is that caregivers are so burdened right now. Parents are, you know, with schools suddenly shutting down, now they're all at home and we, most people don't have the resources to hire out all of this care. Um, and we don't have the extended family support because, I mean, for because of many reasons, but also because of the COVID virus, right? And it's infecting the, our older population. So we're really struggling right now. Parents are really struggling all around the world. And that means that there might be less emotional availability to respond to our children. So we really need to focus on, you know, I think it was mentioned in the, um, Dr. Kim, this the problems that children are facing with their family dynamics within the home, right? That's, I think we really need to focus there because that will help to decide whether or not children have kind of longer lasting social emotional effects from the, the pandemic. Uh, from Thanks our so. perspective. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. From our perspective, uh, in a country uh, with uh, huge inequalities in terms of social and economic inequalities, uh, what we can see is that uh, situations of violence, uh, um, uh, parents uh, who are losing their jobs, um, actually are amplifying these this inequalities. So uh, we have children uh, with already uh, existing or previously existing mental disorders, uh, living with parents also who uh, present anxiety, depression, and nowadays are more stressed, uh, who use alcohol. And uh, violence is part of this uh, mechanism uh, associated with uh, economic hardship, uh, unemployment, uh, and uh, which uh, will probably most certainly uh, amplify the inequalities uh, we see in our country. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, at this point, uh, because I think there's still a lot of questions, but I'm going to try and bring in the panelists who have been sitting in the background. And, uh, you know, usually in, in, a, in a meeting like this, we'll all be seated uh, in front and on the stage and we can see each other. So it's important to get everyone in. Uh, so uh, I, I, without further ado, I'm going to bring the three panelists. And if you're wondering where they are coming from, and I'm going to introduce you, you understand that this is really representative of all the continents of the world. Uh, so the first panelist, and ladies first, is uh, Professor Olienka Omik Bodun. She's a a former uh, president of Yakapak, and she hails from Nigeria, is the, um, the uh, professor of psychiatry at the University of Ibadan uh, in Nigeria. Can we have uh, Professor uh, Olienka up here? <laughs> ah, there you are, Olienka. So good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. Yes. And, uh, and the next is um, I'm going to ask um, Professor uh, Nick Kolowenko from. Um, uh, where's, where's my list? Ah, Nick Kolenko from the University of Sydney. He is the, uh, uh, the Deputy Chair of Emerging Minds and the Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Sydney. He's also the coordinator of our ICAM training program. Uh, Nick, uh, love to see you. Are, you. are you still there? Hello, everyone. He's one of our Vice Presidents. 
Uh, okay, I can't see Nick. Can you all see Nick? We can hear him. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good. Hello. Hi, Nick. Hello. And and finally, and 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 not necessarily the last, but the least is Professor Bruno Palisa, uh, immediate past president of Yakapat uh, from um, the University Paris Sud uh, from France, and um, here he is. <laughs> okay, so we have our three panelists. You've been listening very quietly uh, in the background to the to, to our speakers. Uh, love to hear from you, uh, your views on um, uh, what we've learned from these three speakers and some comments. Now, as I said, uh, we represent the world here. It's uh, from all over the, all the continents, uh, as far as we can see. Um, please give some comments and uh, we, we can start with all the anchor. We can't hear you. I think you're muted, Olienka. Oh, there you are. It's working now. Oops. <laughs> now we lost you again. <laughs> oh, finally. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. I can hear you. I, yeah, I, I think the 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 controls are be, are being done centrally. Yes. Um, it's an extreme delight. Um, I'm extremely delighted to be um a part of this um webinar, and um, I have listened to all the various speakers, and um, I'm just trying to see how we can put. I could put things in my own context. Um, here, right here in Nigeria, um, represent, uh, we're looking at representing generally sub-Saharan Africa. And um, in many ways, the COVID um, pandemic has affected us in Africa a particular, in, a bit differently. Um, in terms of our rates, uh, in my country of 200 million people, which is almost similar to what we have in Brazil. So far, we just we have um, 36,000 people affected, and um, the number of people who have died have been 789. So, um, for some reason, for several reasons, I think the Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, has had a different um, a tilt from this pandemic. Our, our, our curves have been more gradual. And then in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a, a, quite a rapid rise. Um, and I think this is for several reasons. One of the reasons I would say is because of the demographic um, picture we have. We are generally a very youthful population. Um, I was listening to... Um, our speaker from Brazil, and he was saying that their population of 19 and below, I think it's about 33%. But we have um, about 50% who are children and adolescents. So I think we have um, our life expectancy rates are very low, are, very, are still quite low. So uh, we don't have that large elderly population that has really caused the, the big, um, uh, 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 mortality rates that we've seen in many parts of the Western world. Another reason I think is that because of our co um, our difficulties with healthcare services, many people would not survive if they have some of the comorbidities that you would find in the Western world. Like many people who have survived in the Western world have had very severe comorbidities, um, different kinds of cancers and, um, and other forms of um, long-standing illnesses. But those people in our own context would have died long ago because we simply don't have the healthcare facilities to keep them going. And um, lastly, I, I also think is that we don't also don't have our elderly population leaving in a lot of old people's homes or institutions. 
generally we still have a very large extended family setup so a lot of the um, elderly people will be in within the family setups not in not um, congregated together in um, institutions and then i i i don't know what um, role the weather has played in this but we really don't have a lot of air conditioning and we're generally a very outdoor people our markets are outdoor and a lot of these factors so it will be really interesting at the end of it all to find out what the researchers say but we have largely been spared those large mortality rates that we have seen in the western world and i think it's also a big blessing because we, we if we had had those mortality rates we would have totally crashed because we simply don't have the healthcare infrastructure in place and then not only that and paying for health care is out of pocket most people don't have health insurance so that would have been a real real tragic situation if we had had those rapid rates that we found in other parts of the world now coming home to um child and adolescent psychiatry or child and adolescent mental health i was listening very intently to um susan our speaker about idps because also in a lot of parts of sub-saharan africa we have a lot of children who live in especially difficult situations and circumstances we have a lot of children who live in conflict reading zones um, um children who live on the streets children who um who are who, who have to walk and so on so in that regard um it's really really it would have been really difficult how do we now care for children on the streets children who don't have homes and that's i don't know what has been done with that because i know brazil also may have quite a similar population we also have a large conflict zone mm. in the northeast of nigeria and that, that's the the area where there's been a lot of boko haram problems and i know that a lot of the problems a lot of the children were in uh, the internally displaced people camp camps and a lot of the problems that were listed by Susan are also being reported by the child and adolescent mental health professionals who are in that zone where there's a lot of conflict suddenly schools were stopped so these children had no schools to go to also at the start of the covid pandemic there was a problem with supplies so many of these children the supplies to food and the daily needs was cut off suddenly. And then the other aspect was for those of the children whose parents were affected with COVID, they had to move in and they were separated from their parents and caregivers. So there was a lot of anxiety in that part of the world. So there's in that regard, the, I mean, the conflict zones have had a large, you know, a lot of difficulties. So we have increases in problems like malnutrition uh, um, and then because the healthcare systems stopped um, functioning for a while we have that children with um, illnesses like um, epilepsy could not access their anti-epileptic medication so there was a kind a lot of children had relapses of their problems so that's some of the problems that we have been facing and um, what what we have done generally we do, um, in, in those of us who, who run child and adolescent psychiatry facilities is immediately we moved into um, MNET uh, consultations online. So we, we now had to start, and we'd never really done this before. We'd always had face-to-face -face consultation. But in order to meet up with a sudden need after we were able to find our feet, because for a couple of weeks, when the lockdowns came in, everybody was at home and we really didn't know what was happening. But gradually, we've been able to transit into a system whereby we, can't, we, we have online consultations. And that is the way we are able to reach out to our patients and able to support the families that we are supposed to support. The other problems we've had is that because of the stoppage in schools 
and the fact that many families, about 70% of families in, this, in, the, in our areas live in poverty and they live in very, very crowded homes. So you could have a family of a father, mother and eight children living in one room and then they live in a house where they share facilities with several other families. So issues of social distancing has been very, very difficult. And then there's been a lot of reports of, um, of um, abuse, particularly rape, rape um, incidents in this, during this period, because people are living in very crowded situations. Um, our speaker from um, Korea was speaking about, you know, caregivers trying to spend time alone and then having exercise. Many of those things for, for the vast number of um, the population are simply not possible because there's simply nowhere you can go to exercise or, or, or have time alone because there's so much crowding. Um, with regards to school, the, in my part of, of, of the world, a lot of the private schools have been able to transit into online um, instruction. But that is just for a few, a very, very mi minute part of the population. The vast majority of the children who attend public schools have not been able to access online education. So they've been sitting around for several months with any form, without any form of structured education. And that, of course, we know has a lot of consequences when we eventually pick up. So there, those are some of the issues that we've had in this part of the world. I don't know how many minutes I, I if I've run out of time, but I yes. think I'll just start off with that. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Olenka. I'm gonna pick up from that last point and ask um, Nick to follow on because there was also a question about schools and when should schools reopen and um, you know, uh, uh, is it right to do it? Um, and, and, and in places where you know uh, people are not so well to do where e-resources are not available, then uh, what happens to the children if they are not back in school and, and what kind of pressures they feel? So Nick, you could talk to that and, and maybe a little bit about what's happening in Australia. Thank you very much and thank you. Really hear some of a fantastic range of presentations. Uh, look, I'll talk very briefly about schools. Uh, certainly the context in Australia is that most schools are back or partly back. But we do have some regions that are going back into school closures and back to remote learning. It's been quite a challenge, I think, because the impact of quarantine can be quite distressing for some. I think uh, Professor Bung Yun talked a lot about the impact on routines, the impact on families, and the stress of uh, often wor working at home uh, in the context of lockdown and quarantine while also trying to school children. Uh, so there are a number of there's a number of stresses that you know arise from that. The other thing that's happened in Australia is um, I think the importance of the school-based um, resilience approaches that you've been talking about uh, in South Korea have been a key part of a public health response in Australia as well. And we've moved towards establishing probably a slightly different emphasis, which is around managing community trauma and that a key platform or a key plank of maintaining resilience, which I think is a key theme of all your presentations, has been to include the school system along with family systems and the importance of maintaining family resilience. And in fact, all of your presentations really built on that theme of maintaining resilience and the importance, I think, that you identified in Brazil of family stress and particularly parent stress. So we've had a lot uh, of developments in primary care, particularly focusing on developing community strengths. Partly we had a rehearsal for a national disaster, different to a pandemic, but that was with the impact of bushfires across about 70% of our country and its impact on closing down schools and communities and in a sense breaking up much of community infrastructure. So in some respects, we had a, a two or three month head start on dealing with mass disaster responses that were then so quickly followed, followed by the pandemic and a subsequent shutdown. So the impacts of quarantine have been somewhat compounded by the history uh, that we've recently experienced in Australia of bushfires and then the scope of the pandemic exercise. But I guess we've been also quite lucky in that the numbers of cases and the number of deaths 
have been quite similar to the South Korean kind of approach. What probably has been a bit different um, in our region in the Pacific, at least, is that we continue to experience the impact of climate change with a far high, a greater range, not only of bushfires, but of cyclones in the Pacific. And uh, Vanuatu was struck by a cyclone. The usual range of international responses to support those disaster responses haven't been available in the way they previously have in our region and have relied much more on local resources. The other thing I do want to emphasise, I think in Australia is probably a bit different, a bit different is the advantage of being an island nation and that has somewhat protected us. But telehealth has really taken off in Australia in a way that might be different to the rest of the world. The government has been a strong supporter of telehealth uh, health delivery in primary care and also funded it in the private system at least for six months. And has also allowed a platform uh, for child and psychiatry specialist services to, do, to join that. There have been some many clinical guides about telehealth uh, conduct uh, for clinicians, the ethical issues involved, uh, those sorts of issues, similarly around really remote uh, education and learning in the school system to support teachers and adequate training to do that. So this has allowed some continuity. There was about a 25% reduction in access to healthcare uh, right across the board, be it mental health care or other health care during quarantine. This is slowly picking up, it's not quite back to normal rates in the community. And as you noticed in your settings, for example, in Brazil, inpatient services have pretty much remained as they have been. The other emphasis has been to develop, I think, community resources, parent-led resources, uh, family partnership resources, to really support parents and kids talking about COVID and its impact at home, as the key feature of resilience being what happens at home. Uh, and Susan alluded to the importance of attachment relationships and the closeness of families, even when they're stressed, in finding a way together about how to build resilience in a family context. So it's been really a conjunction of school initiatives, I think, with wider community initiatives that supported the impact of quarantine uh, and the ongoing impact uh, that will have its impact throughout the economy and impact on poverty and the importance of socio economic support reaching far into the future. Um, well, that um, it'd be great if I could get uh, Bruno to make some comments. I know that we are really short on time, but Bruno is uh, very mathematical. I'm sure he can come up with a good answer to all the comments that's been made. Uh, I don't know whether you had a chance to read some of them. Um, uh, anything that you have uh, you wanted to add um, and also maybe a European perspective. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, hello, everybody. It, it, it was fascinating to be able to uh, to listen all to, to all these talks. Uh, my first impression is that uh, in Europe, like in uh, the whole planet, uh, child and adolescent psychiatrists did a great job. Uh, they adapted themselves very quickly. Uh, and my feeling yeah. is that being trained as a physician uh, you have been in an emergency department and you know how to react very quickly in a context of emergency. And they did that and they did that very well. Uh, but all was not quite so good. And on my feeling, the prevention and communication uh, were not that good. It was not only child and adolescent psychiatrists. Remember a couple of months ago, all physicians, scientists were on the media it was quite a panic. It was quite a, a, a manic defense against their own anxiety. They were speaking about the virus and you, you realize that in the previous months, science was not always the best. <clears throat> so in the media, you had many people speaking about everything. You had also people speaking about advocacy, why not? And you had also people speaking for their ego. This is always like that. But concerning anxiety, we are therapists. You know that when you, you are in a context of anxiety, it is very dangerous to speak about anxiety because you risk to stimulate other people's anxiety. And this is even more true as uh, this type of anxiety in an epidemic is a very particular. There has been a paper written by the Psycho Psychoanalytic Association of Australia and New Zealand that says that this anxiety 
is not a neurotic anxiety. This is a mass anxiety, and so it is very difficult to deal with it. So if we communicate with that, how should we do? I think because my feeling is that children and uh, Guillerme show data about that, uh, children in the general population were not so bad. Of course, they there will be problems because there was a, a, a chronic intense stress and it was a problem for everybody. But my feeling is that for children, uh, there will be less problem than for adults because children are able to adapt much more than adults. And in fact, the main problem of children came during this epidemic from the anxiety of their parents. And so we have to be care about adults in order to be care about children and how to be care about adults. I propose to split between behaviors and cognition. Uh, when you go in the street, you wear a dress, shoes, and now you wear a mask and you wash hands. This is a behavior. Now, after that, do you think really that life has changed? Not that much. Of course, there is an economic crisis, but in 2008, there was an economic crisis too. And, and psychiatrists didn't say anything about that. Of course, uh, <laughs> There will be people that will die, but in my country, which was particularly affected by the virus, in fact, the number of deaths increased only by 3% during the year. So objectively, we have not to stimulate anxiety of people. And my feeling is that when we speak about the epidemic, we use always COVID, pandemic, disaster, and this is no good for everybody. If we want to protect children, we have to use peaceful words. It will be effective. Right. A very, um, a very, very uh, wise words from <laughs> Bruno, as always. And uh, I am really sorry we, we really ran out of time. Uh, it is already just past 9 p.m. Uh, this is 9 p.m. in Singapore. And uh, I have been traveling around the world, actually, to, like all of you, um, but online and virtually. I've uh, been to pa uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Turkey, both coasts of the US in virtual conversations. And um, yes, it's true. I think uh, if we are not careful and we, we, we instill the fear, the, the mass hysteria that you are describing, Bruno, then certainly um, it does um, have an impact on our children. But I suppose there is a new normal. The new practice that we have uh, will stay with us for, uh, for a bit. And, I, uh, one, one, one is, of course, this webinar, which is a demonstration of how um, we're not able to meet physically and uh, although we want to so much, today would have been the day that we would have met uh, as the opening <laughs> of our 24th World Congress. It comes for me to say that uh, uh, this World Congress is now going virtual. I'm sure you heard the announcement. Uh, details will follow. Uh, the virtual Congress is going to be on the 2nd to 4th of December. Um, I don't think I have much time to go into the details, but really the idea is to bring some of this learning and, and sharing of information and uh, knowledge and academic child psychiatry together uh, at the end of this year. And um, we're also starting a blog, so I would like to announce that. And this, mo uh, this morning I wrote a little short um, thing that uh, that's placed on our blog. It hasn't, I think we haven't given the link on the main website, but, but watch out for the blog. It's be uh, For the moment, it's just between me and, and Hesham. Uh, uh, but uh, we hope that many of you will also uh, start to uh, write down some narratives of our journey together because I think um, this common bond of an illness that is um, really make us appear and feel that we're human is also the very source of our strength as a community, as a, as a, uh, as a population in the world. And really regardless of race, language and religion, we can come together and work as one to improve the emotional lives of our children and their families. So um, thank you very much. Uh, finally, I'd like to just thank, uh, I have three things to say. Um, I, I know they're flashing some of the slides about some of the speakers and you can look at that. We'd like to thank the organizing team from MCI, um, quite a number of them. I don't think I'll name names, but thank them for organizing this. And also to our speakers, uh, Bung Yun, Suzanne, Gulaim, for giving their fascinating insights on this pandemic from their parts of the world and also how we really share common uh, commonalities 
and then also the panelists, uh, Nick Olienka and Bruno for chiming in with their ideas, and our chair for the webinar, uh, uh, Ting, for her, her thoughtful inputs. Uh, most of all, I, I want to thank uh, the almost, I think if I have the figure correctly, there are just about 1,600 um, participants, there were about 2,000 over who had registered, who came online to listen. We will place all of this, uh, today's um, um, webinar, online on the website, and you can go and download and, and watch it at your own leisure. Uh, we will, we've got way too many questions to answer straight away. So what I will ask um, uh, our organizers to do is to send some of the questions which are directed to some of the speakers for their answers, and we will post those answers online uh, on the website so that you can you can look at that. I believe somebody has also posted um, the uh, the pearl and the butterfly story. Apparently, there's a PDF. It's available online as well. So um, <laughs> you can go and watch and, and read that story. That I believe WHO also has a story that's uh, that's online. It's actually on the IACAPAP website, um, which talks about how we can help our children um, um, manage themselves uh, through a story and um, and not have this overwhelming fear that uh, Bruno speaks of. And with that, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, keep safe until we meet again, uh, virtually, but eventually we will meet, I'm sure, face to face. Thank you very much. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.